Hello, this episode of The Flying Reporter comes from the LAA Grassroots Fly-In at Popham. It's Friday the 2nd of September 2022 and this is a fast turnaround video capturing a flavour of the first day of the fly-in. It used to be called the LAA Rally and since 2009 it's been held at Northampton Sywell. We'll find out later why there's been a change. It might be a different venue, but the event still has its friendly atmosphere and charm, a respectable turnout and plenty to see. Soon after I arrived, my eyes were drawn to this replica Spitfire. I didn't know, you know, that you could build your own Spitfire, but apparently you can. And Steve has done it. Uh, you're from Odium in Hampshire? Yes, that's right. And you always wanted a Spitfire? Absolutely. <laughs> ever, si ever since I was about eight years old and saw Reach for the Sky, yeah. the movie about Douglas Bardo, if, yeah. if you know that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but it was never to be for some time. I, I tried on two occasions to buy a, a, a World War II Spitfire mm. uh, and then a, a sharing one. And on both occasions, I was sort of outbid and missed the boat. So. Uh, and so you thought you'd build your own, and there are such things, there are kits for there are kits, Spitfire there kits. Are kits for I never knew that. That's I never right. Knew that. There's a company called Supermarine yeah. who, who bought the rights to the name, yes. uh, and they've been selling these kits for about 15 years now. Wow. Well, nearly 20, actually, time flies. And had you built an aircraft before? No, but I'd been flying vintage aeroplanes for 30 odd years yeah. uh, before I started building this. So. Tell me about, I mean, you, you can call it a replica Spitfire, presumably, and, and yep. you know, how, how does it differ, if right. anything, um, to the... It's 80% the... it's, it's scale, Yeah. so eight tenths as long and wide and high. Uh, and and that, why was that? Well, that means that you can do with a smaller engine. You can't buy a brand new Merlin today, no, no. and nobody makes a 1,000 horsepower piston engine, right, right, right? Right. but you can buy 250 or 300 horsepower engines because they fit them in very powerful motor cars, yes. uh, and that's why the scale is smaller. Oh. And, and the mass is interesting because 8 tenths, 8 tenths, 8 tenths, if you do it, is 512 over 1,000. So it's half the volume mm. and therefore requires about a quarter of the power. So that's, that's, that's why we did that. In all other respects, is it... Uh, is it true to the original design or...? No, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's not... Um, structurally it's, it's different, mm. um, but in terms of flight uh, performance, mm. um, it comes out at about two-thirds of the performance of a Mark I Spitfire mm. um, with about a seventh or an eighth of the fuel consumption, mm. so that's, that's a nice thing. Uh, and how long did it take you to build? Uh, I started in, in 2006, yeah. so that's nearly 16 years ago. Okay, and you finished it very recently? Uh, well, it was, it was first of all completed in 2017. Mm. It went to RAF Odium for taxi trials. Mm. It, it then moved to Endstone, which is where there's a squadron of these kits being built. Uh, for its first test flight, but the engine overheated. <laughs> and it took me a year to sort that out. Yeah. Went back again, had another three test uh, flights with another test pilot, um, but it was still on the warm side, so it came home for another year. Uh, and then it came here, and I've been test flying it here up until about five weeks ago, five or six weeks ago. So it has its permit now, or? This morning, the <laughs> LAA and the CAA had a, had a, a formal handover uh, of, of the permit, so I, I got it today. How does that feel, and how does it feel to I've, have I've it? still got the smile, and it's lovely, <laughs> it's wonderful. And Steve was in his element at the show, talking to visitors about his labour of love. From an historic design to something very new, I think for the first time in the UK, the Sling HW. Well, this aircraft here has been gaining quite a lot of attention. Uh, it's the Sling HW. HW stands for High Wing. And this is Tim Hardy, who's the UK distributor for Sling Aircraft. Give me a little potted history of Sling for those that don't know about you. OK, so uh, Sling Aircraft have been going since uh, 2009, uh, based in uh, Tetherfield near Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, the factory 
um, uh, committed to the first round the world flight in 2009 when the prototype Sling 2 flew to Oshkosh from Johannesburg and then carried on for a worldwide flight uh, around the other side of the world and back to Johannesburg after 42 days or something. Mm. So quite a, quite a, a notable feat. Uh, I think the longest leg was from uh, Conakry on the west coast of Africa to uh, Belém in Brazil. So quite a first for such a small aeroplane. Mm. Tell me about the HW, a four-seater, uh, yep. just over a ton, maximum takeoff weight. Yep. Um, tell, tell me about it, why? Because this is your first high wing. This is our first high wing. We have a, a range of low wing aircraft, the Sling TSR and the Sling 2. Um, the high wing was developed with um, essentially the American market in mind because we found that the American market prefers to have a high wing because it's easier to get in and out of. Right. Um, so the aircraft is based around the Rotax 915 IS motor, developing 141 horsepower, um, electric constant speed propeller, and um, yes, four-seater. I bet it's got some crazy performance, hasn't it? I mean, in terms of uh, uh, fuel performance. Yes, so the Rotax is super economical, yeah. and the Rotax 915, at full chat, is going to be using about 32, 33 <laughs> litres an hour. Um, Doing so what with speed a, with that? 145 knots. Yeah, so that's crazy. And yeah. uh, 250 litres of fuel in the in the tanks, mm. and you can go some, go yeah. places, yeah. So what's the whole thing about Sling? What is Sling trying to do? What sort of niche is it carving? Adventure. Right. That's what it's all about. Yeah. And it's the means for people to enjoy their own adventures, mm. you know. Um, yes, the Sling 2 is ideal for training, mm -hmm. Uh, but generally speaking, people like to go out, visit, see places, and expand their horizons. I mean, that's what travel is all about. Mm. So this is a perfect um, vehicle to do that. Great. And it's getting a lot of uh, love at, uh, at the LAA Flying. Uh, it is, yeah. Lots of people come round interested in it. It looks new. It is brand new. Mm. Um, and a lot of people are, are really liking the way it's easy to get into the um, the actual uh, finish of the aircraft and so on. And bearing in mind this is only serial number three mm. and we have a, a track record of improvement, continuous improvement. Mm. You know, it bodes well for the future. And I look at you. Okay. Well, we're going to kind of, we're facing this way. Okay. We'll talk to each other, but... You're a master of editing it anyway, right? <laughs> no matter what happens, you'll make me look good, John. So, What are you skulking around in the background for? To that gentleman over there. Oh, yeah, OK. Tell a good conversation. Look, we're having an interview here. Oh, yeah? Yeah, out, well, out of shot. Yeah. I'm going to go and get a cup of coffee. You want one? I'd love one. You can't get the staff these days. <laughs> uh, I'm with Trevor Pegram. 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 Yeah, Pegram. I had to think there for a second. Um, Head of uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa sales for Garmin. Yeah, and correct. we met, well not here last year, but we met at um, Cywell, I think yeah. it was last year. Can't believe it's been a year. And well, what a, what a year it's been for you guys as well. I mean, everyone struggled with components. Yeah. And what was that caused by and, and how has it affected Garmin? Yeah, great question. Uh, you're not the first person to ask that today, <laughs> John. So it feels like everyone that's come through the Garmin stand, um, a lot of home builders, experimental mm. guys, all asking when can they get their Garmin um, products. And mm -hmm. maybe to answer your first question first, um, what's causing the issue? And I think, you know, we're not immune to component shortages like many other electronic companies are. You just have to read the papers and, and listen to the news about chip shortages affecting car production and car manufacture and those types of things. So um, Garmin has, uh, we consider ourselves a vert vertically integrated company. So we try and do as much in-house as possible, but we do actually, buy a lot of components from around the world and we have large stocks of those components but in the end if you're not getting a constant supply you know your stock and your inventory gets reduced and, and that's essentially what's happened to us. Is it chips or is it other things as well? It's everything. Right. Honestly it's really everything. Yeah. Um, not just with the component shortages but also from a production and, and manufacturing capacity um, you know, it's uh, uh, the COVID situation impacted us as well, but also like a resurgence in GA during COVID. I mean, this really happened. Our business has never been um, as, strong, as strong as it is mm. today, and never people never been flying as many hours mm. as they they've been doing. You said yourself, hundred hours. Yeah. You said yeah, last yeah, year, yeah. and see, we've really seen people getting back into aviation, and they're you know taking the opportunity now to upgrade the aeroplanes. So we've got kind of two things happening, right? Shortage of product and, and a real demand for, for, for Garmin products mm. as well. 
So certainly not immune to that. But really, kind of, I'd say to everyone that's come through that's, that's building an aeroplane or, or really interested in an upgrade, get your order in as soon as possible. So we what do is have the lead, lead time times. now on stuff? It's actually coming down, mm. thankfully. So yeah. we, we're, I would say we're over the hump now. Right, right. Um, and, you know, sort of uh, earlier on this year, we were up to six months on some components. Um, transponders was a real tough one. Um, and, uh, yeah, some, some longer lead times there. But I think we're on the backside of it now, quite honestly. Mm. Um, we still it's kind of look like whack-a-mole where <laughs> we fix one issue yeah. and, and something else comes up and, and we're really having to deal with that. But I think it is getting better. It is improving. But still, the message is order early. Uh, and you know, get your order in with your dealer. Now I know um, a big thing for you at the moment is Smart Glide. Yeah. Um, and tell me about it. Where, you know, how can I get Smart Glide on my aircraft, but particularly if I'm on a permit type or yeah. yeah and, and and you know, how does it work? It's a, it's a great question. And uh, you know, Smart Glide is just a, a part of our autonomy family of products, right? So we're really trying to introduce new safety, new capability, and, and really make flying safer. So it's just one component of, of a safer cockpit and a safer flying experience with Garmin. But Smart Glide's been incredibly popular. Just actually had a, had a couple through here this morning, and um, you know, he, she, she's a, he's a pilot, she's not, and she was really interested in these types of safety features that can be added to the cockpit to really make the whole experience safer. And, and the great thing about Smart Glide, it's just reach out, push of a button, um, it will get you uh, set up to uh, a nearest airfield uh, that can be reached in the case of an engine failure or an engine um, issue. Mm. Um, and it is compatible with a range of Garmin products, really starting at the low end of, 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 of just a basic screen and, and that will, just a Garmin G3X screen will give you the basic capability of smart life. So you don't need a navigator, for example, to make that work? No, and actually that's so, with our certified products you do, yeah. um, but with the experimental products, yeah. really you just need a single screen G3X system and that's got enough of the software built in. Um, you don't even need to have an autopilot, um, you just really need the, the display, and that's got the capability. Now, of course, you can add a Garmin autopilot, mm. and then that will allow you to connect your autopilot, and actually the autopilot will fly you to that uh, to the location. There. Brilliant. So, yeah, really great system. Great to see you at uh, the, I was going to say LAA rally, but it's the grassroots fly. Is that's what it's called? <laughs> that's, that's what, what they're calling, calling it, yeah. it. So, yeah, great, great to see you again. And, uh, Take care. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>
they, I think they say you, you, if you could put up a shelf, you can build one. I think it probably takes a bit more than that, but you, you learn as you go along. Mm. And uh, it's yeah, you, you don't you, you, yeah, you don't need any huge skills or anything like that. Mm. I think the, the most thing you need is persistence and patience. Lacking in both of those things, I don't see myself ever building my own aeroplane. But well done to Robbie and all the other dedicated builders who are showing off their work here today. Well, I found the CEO of the Light Aircraft Association, Steve Slater. Thanks for inviting me along You're to, welcome. I nearly said the LAA rally, which it isn't okay. now. It's the grassroots fly-in. Um, always used to be called the LAA rally, didn't it? Why, why, why has it changed? Well, we weren't able to go to our traditional rally venue of Sywell this year uh, for various reasons, and we had to seek a new venue. This venue became available to us and was certainly the best of the bunch. Um, and it's a different sort of a venue. It's a grass runway, it's a big grass field, as you can see. Uh, it's much more intimate. And we decided we wouldn't, we'd handle expectations. We didn't expect anything on the scale of the LAA rally, so we called it the LAA Grassroots Fly-In. And it has actually taken us back to our roots for flying for fun from a grass airfield with a great social atmosphere. And it seems to be going down really well. Popham is a, is a great place. It's a fun place. It's got a great attitude to GA. Um, and um, not as big as you say it as Cywell, but you've had what, in excess of 200 people flying in today? Yes, in excess of 200 aircraft and probably well over 1,500 visitors, mm -hmm. uh, including by road. Um, we've got the apron parking area behind us here, uh, not a tarmac apron, but a lovely area of grass. It is on a slope, but you, know, you can't actually change Hampshire that radically. <laughs> um, but, uh, and we also have an additional parking area over beside the runway. Uh, for the C of A types and also overspill from this area because with 200 plus aircraft in here it was pretty well full by lunchtime so we're just now at the stage where we've got everybody returning home but it's been a huge success everybody's saying it exceeded their expectations and that has to be a good thing. Obviously it's been a year since I last saw you what, what's happened in the last year what are the new developments this year I know we've, we've got the 600 kilogram kilo which, yeah. is, which is all I mean that's all coming into effect now. Well we've it? got a lineup in the trade area there of uh, four in a row of the 600 kg microlight types and again that's a lovely sight to see that the, the market is already burgeoning there and these aircraft are factory built you buy them from the factory ready to fly and that takes out that kit building element equally we've got some of the most exciting new kit aircraft here including the new sling high wing which we're working on the approval system for at the moment this is the prototype aircraft that flew from cape town in south africa to Oshkosh in the USA and is now continuing on its world tour coming back from Oshkosh via the UK and here it is on our stand and uh, well I, actually I, I'm guessing it's there on the stand all I can see is a crowd of people around it. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other developments either in the LAA or in the uh, field of permit aircraft and LAA types? Well in the, certainly in the field of permit aircraft we're working with our friends at the CAA at the moment to look at uh, certain uh, types where there is no longer factory support for certificated types potentially for them to move into the LAA permit to fly Which system. Types of those? I won't name them just right. yet, it puts a bit of too much pressure on our friends <laughs> at the CAA. There's going to be some significant changes to licensing, the CAA were hoping to announce that today but have had to defer the announcement because the lawyers are still picking through it. Oh, um, but we'll, we'll get that. Uh, we've had a great announcement of Mike Pearson uh, who actually runs Popham Airfield mm is taking over the role of the GA advocate for the uh, Department for Transport as, as well as running Popham. So he's going to be a busy man for the next, uh, next few years. Um, we've got uh, a presentation which I'm due to literally give in 10 minutes on some of the new types coming to the LAA, mm. including the first manned eVTOL aircraft uh, which we're working on with the CA again on the certification of. So we're definitely moving forward with some exciting new types. But equally as exciting to me is there's a beautiful old Clem or BA Swallow over there from the 1930s and tucked down in the dell as we're calling it, there's a wooded area down there that gives both shelter to the vintage aircraft and a lovely circular location for all these vintage types. There's a DH-60 moth that I've never seen before and I really want to get some time off to go down and take a look at it but I haven't yet. Oh. Oh, you've got this presentation to give so I can't even say yeah. go now. But, uh... Steve, thanks for inviting me and um, it's congratulations been a, on today. I hope you have a great weekend. It's been a pleasure and I still haven't stopped smiling. <laughs> so the grassroots fly-in is coming to a close uh, for Friday. The event continues uh, over the weekend. Um, it's got a bit cloudy here now. 
So I don't know what the weather holds uh, for the rest of the weekend, but a very, very busy day here, and I've had a great time um, seeing all the exhibits and the stands, but most importantly, seeing um, some old friends and uh, familiar faces as well. That's all for this episode. Fly safely, my friends.